Hi, and welcome to Tollfoot Alliance Church for the weekend message of May 3rd. A few months ago, I sketched an outline of some messages that I wanted to share on deep values. Values that have shaped me, values that have shaped our church, that are foundational to the church. I decided these would be good messages to share during Communion Sundays through this spring. The value of scripture, church, worship, and missions. But I used very active verbs, the value of listening, the value of gathering, the value of submitting, and the value of proclaiming. Who would have guessed that God, with his impeccable timing and in delicious sense of humor, would have me talking about the value of gathering at the heart of this period when we cannot gather in the way that we're used to. This morning, I want to consider a classic text of scripture that encourages us not to give up meeting together. So what does that mean during a time of pandemic? There are places in the world where congregations are using scripture such as those to mandate that they should be able to keep meeting to defy the restrictions of the government. Well, that's not my intention. But what I do want to do is to explore the value of the church, not as a building in which we gather, but as a group of people who are committed to following Jesus and making him known in their community, in their world. We un unconsciously overlay scripture with our own perception, with our own cultural understanding of the church. The church in the first centuries, the time when the church went through its most rapid expansion, was a time that was far different than the church that we have now. The Euler church did not have many of the things that have become a very comfortable part of our church today. They didn't have buildings. They didn't have budgets. They didn't have a complete Bible. They didn't have an articulated doctrinal statement, let alone some of the modern additions, things like hymn books or book, uh, bulletins or piano or organ or worship bands or PowerPoint or sound systems. They just gathered. They were followers of Jesus, the risen one who invited them to his new kingdom that stood in contrast and defiance to the kingdom's of this world. They gathered in hope. Hope of Jesus returning, yes. Hope of heaven, should they die before Jesus returns, yes. But also a, a living hope. A hope with the insurance that they are already part of Jesus' kingdom. He is already their Lord. And they gathered to figure out what that would look like in their relationships as they navigated both the blessings and the hardship of life. Many times in the early church and through the ages, Believers have found themselves having to gather secretly. The world considered them subversive, and governments have sought to stamp out this movement of people who claim a different Lord, one that is above the rulers of this world. So when the church was gathered by persecution, it found a way to gather. And when the church is scattered by pandemic, it will still find a way to gather. I want to look at a couple of verses that can help us to gather well. Even when we can't do so in person or in large groups, let's consider a couple of important passages about the church and about gathering. One is in Ephesians 3 verse 10 and the other is in Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 25. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God has a purpose for the church. And a pandemic doesn't change that. God intends to display his wisdom to the rulers in the heavenly realms. Now you may wonder, how does that happen when there's a church that has problems? Remember, the church is the bride of Christ. And yes, the church has problems because the structures of the church have always been constructed through flawed and human efforts. And there are times when that has gone terribly sideways. But the essence of the church continues strong. A throng of people who have placed their trust in Jesus and accepted his invitation to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In our culture, where the individual has become sovereign, has become king, we can fall into the trap about making salvation about us individually. We invite Jesus into our lives so that we can go to heaven when we die. Have you ever noticed how self-centered that explanation of salvation sounds, and also how conveniently it avoids the dominant New Testament proclamation that Jesus is Lord, 
He is the ruler. Yes, Jesus does promise to make his home with those who open the door to him. But he also invites us to enter his kingdom, to submit to his authority, to his instruction, to his direction in our lives. Salvation is not only asking Jesus into our heart, it is accepting his invitation into his kingdom so that his purpose can be accomplished. He wants to make his wisdom known to the rulers in the heavenly realms. He wants to establish his rule in an ever-increasing way upon this earth. And all of this is anticipating that time when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Christ and he reigns forever. So God is using the church to accomplish his purposes. Even in this time, when we cannot gather, he is doing that. This pandemic will not kill the church. There will be some changes. Some individual congregations will grow stronger. Some will grow weaker. weaker. But God will continue to build the church and to fulfill his purposes through the church. This may be a time of uncertainty from a human perspective, but it's a time of expectancy from a spiritual perspective. God is calling us to be a church. And that call includes a call to coming together, to gathering. Look at Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We hold on to hope. We motivate and equip one another for love and good deeds. We meet together and encourage one another. That's all part of gathering. That's all part of being the church. But understand how we do that well and how we do that in these times of pandemic when we can't gather at our buildings. We need to understand a little bit, a little bit about the word church. We've got a lot of baggage connected with that word. In scripture, the word that's translated church is a word that was commonly used, but it didn't originally have a religious meaning. It was a word that simply meant assembly or congregation. When Jesus was teaching on conflict, he said, start by dealing with the person individually. If that doesn't work, take one or two people with you. And then if that still doesn't work, take it to the assembly, to the gathering, a word that sometimes was translated church. Jesus taught that before the church, New Testament church, was established with the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts. The assembly, the gathering, the congregation, it was just a larger group of people who, in that culture, made decisions. It could be a local council, it could be a synagogue, it could be the city elders. Once Jesus rose again and believers began to gather regularly, the word church began to be used primarily to refer to the gathering of Christians or religious gatherings. And eventually it shifted to describe the buildings where they gathered. In the first three centuries of Christianity, they met wherever they could. There were no buildings. Christianity was unwelcome and illegal in most of the places where it was first established. In the year 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine signed the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity legal. And it was only after that time that believers started to invest into dedicated buildings that where they would meet that would eventually be called churches. So the first 300 years of Christianity, the identity of believers was not in a specific place. Not in a place where they gathered, but the common journey of faith that they unpacked together as they met in small clusters of believers. As they met, they read the portions of the letters they had from the apostles. They figured out how the Jewish scriptures related to the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. They discovered how Jesus fulfilled the law and how that applied in a mixed gathering of Jews and Gentiles, slaves and free, women and men. Together they followed Jesus. This was the gathering. Now, we're suddenly in a time when we cannot gather in the way and place that's familiar and comfortable. But that does not mean that we cannot be the church, that we can't gather in different ways. And most importantly, it does not mean that this is wasted time. God is up to something individually and as a congregation and in the worldwide church. 
Earlier this week, I found myself being discouraged with the prospect of the restrictions on gathering extending all the way through the summer. What will that mean for the church? In many ways, we don't know. However, as I thought about it, I reflected on how God used waiting periods as a time of preparation in the lives of saints and throughout the pages of history. You look at it. Ezekiel, he spent 390 days laying on his side in order to deliver a prophetic message to prepare the nation of Israel for exile. Joseph spent many years in prison, and God used that as a time of preparation so that he could rescue Joseph's family from famine. Moses spent 40 years in social isolation on the backside of a hill watching some sheep in order to prepare him be to the one who would deliver a nation from slavery in Egypt. The nation of Israel spent 40 years waiting in a desert in order to shape them into a people ready to enter the promised land. Paul spent years in prison. And from that isolation, many of the books of the New Testament were written. Those books had far greater reach than if he had continued traveling in person from congregation to congregation. The Apostle John was exiled on the island of Patmos. And that unwelcome exile was a time when heaven was opened and John saw and recorded a new vision of Christ and a new vision of reality. We're in a time of waiting. God is up to something. And even in the midst of this time of waiting, he calls us to gather. So, what does gathering look like when it can't happen in our church building? Let me address that question with a story and with some suggestions. Here's my story. Hope you like it. Once upon a time, a few explorers discovered the ultimate mountain. They shared their discovery with others and soon groups of mountain explorers started gathering together to share their incredible adventure of mountain exploration. They would gather, they would share about their latest explorations and encourage others to new discoveries. The exploration led to all sorts of adventures as they discovered paths and summits and waterfalls and wildlife and caves and meadows and glaciers. Little by little, however, they explored less. But they still gathered to celebrate mountain exploration. And as they gathered, their conversations drifted more towards the discoveries of the past than their current explorations. Still, they claimed their identity was firmly rooted into a, a commitment of being a mountain explorer. They had signed the explorer's pact to change their life. It was their life. After a few years, some explorers decided to build a lodge. This would be a great place to gather to encourage mountain exploration. This idea caught on. And lodges began to spring up all over the mountain. Some were cozy and rustic, accommodating a few dozen people. And their explorers would gather to learn from one another and share stories. Others were elaborate and huge. Huge auditoriums where hundreds could gather to hear tales of famous explorers and learn from expert explorers. Some lodges included libraries with books on exploring and stores that sold gears, gear for exploring and gift shops with kitschy souvenirs with cute pictures of moose and bear and waterfalls. Lodges began to specialize in various types of exploring, hiking, climbing, caving, rafting, skiing, photography, wildlife sighting, bird watching. The mountain was so vast, it was the ultimate mountain after all, and there seemed no end to the diverse strands of exploration that there were. Years passed, decades passed, centuries passed, and mountain exploration became an entire industry. More lodges were built, all dedicated to inviting more and more people to explore this ultimate mountain and helping people to become better explorers. A favorite part of their gathering was when people signed the Explorers Pact. But a troubling trend had developed. While many gathered to celebrate exploring, fewer and fewer actually ventured out onto the glorious mountain. It was far easier to gather and talk about exploring than to go exploring. One year, something unthinkable happened. A fire broke out on the mountain and all the lodges were inaccessible. What would they do? 
They were mountain explorers, and they could not gather at the lodges devoted to encouraging mountain exploration. So for a few weeks, they were paralyzed. Their routine was upended, and their identity as mountain explorers seemed in jeopardy. But gradually, the explorers discovered that while parts of the mountain were on fire and their lodges were inaccessible, there were vast stretches of the mountain that they hadn't yet explored, and vast stretches that they could still explore. So once again, they began to venture out exploring. And again, as they ventured out, they started meeting each other and gathering together. The lodges were closed, but they gathered by streams or waterfalls or summits or in the meadows. It wasn't as convenient, it wasn't as comfortable as meeting in the lodges, but a significant shift took place as they gathered at different times and different places. The energy of their gatherings was so much greater than it had been in the lodges. They started sharing about their current exploration, not that just the stories of the past years or decades. At the lodges, they had heard experts give polished lectures on how to explore. Now, they shared tips with friends and companions about new paths or caves or summits or meadows that they had recently discovered. They encouraged others to check out these new discoveries. They shared their gear and their equipment. Their gathering at the lodges had been good, but they didn't realize how routine and comfortable and stale they had become. This welcome, unwelcome inconvenience had rekindled their love for exploring and moved them from talk to the adventure of exploring. They didn't know how long the fire would last or how deeply their lodges would be affected by the fire, but they did know this. There was so much more of the ultimate mountain to explore and with or without the lodges, they would find ways to gather, to share the incredible journey of being a mountain explorer. Now that's just a story, but I think you can connect the dots. Church isn't about the place or the comfortable routine or the comfortable liturgy that takes place in a building. Church is a gathering of people who have committed to being followers of Jesus. People who have accepted his invitation to fellowship with the eternal trinity. And that is an incredible adventure. And like the ultimate mountain, there's always more to explore. So even without a building in which to gather, we can find ways to journey and ways to share that journey with others. Let's look at that verse in Hebrews again, but let's widen the focus to appreciate the larger context of that scripture. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new live and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. When you read that, do you notice the incredible adventures of faith that make up the context of the verse that tells us to gather together? The adventure of entering God's presence. The adventure of having our mind transformed so it's no longer controlled by guilt. A mind transformed so it understands spiritual truth. A mind transformed so it can perceive the voice of the good and faithful shepherd. Adventure of good deeds that bless others around us. Adventures of renewed relationships that are anchored in genuine love. In our story, the explorers on the ultimate mountain discovered there was so much more than the well-worn trails close to their lodges. As believers, there is so much more on our journey than just praying to receive Christ, the hope of heaven when we die, and some nice church meetings in between. There's a lifetime of adventure. And this pandemic will set many people here on a new journey. It may be a journey of loss. It may be a journey of less. It may be a journey of learning. 
and students and parents and teachers and even grandparents are on that journey as they discover new pathways of education. It might be a journey of uncertainty. It could be a journey of opportunity as it opens up new ways of business and new ways of relating. It might be a journey of transition. It might be a journey of deepening relationships as your family spends more time together than ever before. It might be a journey of paying attention to emotion that you have been ignoring because of your fast-paced life. It might be a journey of hearing the voice of God during a time of waiting. It might be a journey of trust where we don't know what God is up to until years later or even decades later. But God meets us at every point on our journey. And he calls us to gather together with others to share that journey. There will come a time when we can again hold services at our building on the Sundays. But here's a few suggestions as how we can gather in the meantime. First, be intentional. Develop regular patterns of gathering with other believers. Some of you have found some of those already. And as a church, we're going to be expanding the way that we do that as a congregation. We've used Zoom for a number of gatherings, a senior's coffee time, a children's feature by Zoom, concert of prayer. Some have made the Sunday at 10 a regular time when they listen to the worship set and the message for that day. This Sunday, we're gathering for communion by Zoom. Find a way and guard against that tendency that we can have, that tendency to do it on our own, to cocoon. We need one another. We need you. You need us. There's lots of great content online, and we can consume that on our own. But we need to do so in the context of a faith community with others. Because it's in the context of relationship that we learn to love others, that we learn to forgive others, that we learn to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The church is something that we do together. So be intentional to find a way to do that. Be authentic. Number two, be authentic. One of the drawbacks of gathering in a church building is that we can let those meetings become superficial. We can have that spiritual time when we join in worship times and listen to a message. But the conversation before and after, as important and good as it is to catch up on life and chat about work and sports and vacations, as good as that is, it seldom goes deep. You actually need a more private setting than the foyer of the church for a deeper conversation. This time is a great time to find some safe people with whom you can have those deeper conversations. We're people of hope. But that doesn't exempt us from the emotional journey this disruption has caused. I was listening to a talk this week by Dr. Henry Cloud. You may recognize him uh, from his book, Boundaries, and How People Grow, a very well-known Christian psychologist. And he was explaining how the disruption of this pandemic affects us psychologically. He noted there's, there's four foundations to good mental health. First is connection with people. And now our usual pathways of connection have been blocked. Second is routine, and for many that has been completely disrupted. Third is a sense of control. He noted we drive ourselves crazy if we try and control other people or if we stress about things that we cannot control, but we all need control by way of meaningful choice in our life. And that choice has been taken from us. We can't go out when we want to. We can't go to a restaurant. We can't go on a trip. And finally, we need a sense of accomplishment. We need to do something that we do well and that we enjoy. And for many, their work or their recreation that gave them that sense of accomplishment is gone or threatened. So that disrupts us big time in our emotions. You need some others to process that with, to figure out what's going on, to find some new ways to develop those paths for connection, to develop those paths for routine, and a sense of control and a sense of accomplishment. So connect with others. Have people with whom you talk to about those heart issues. How are you dealing with that disruption? How are you doing on the emotion, emotional and the spiritual journey during this time? The second one is be authentic. Third suggestion is this, be creative. Network with others for ideas. I've heard some families have set up a trailer so their kids can, go, kids can go camping in the garage or in the yard. Some have found some good kids' resources or youth resources that they can share with others. 
Some are finding ways to share music or play games online. Now, some might need some help with tech, and others, you may have some time on your hand and you're good with tech. So reach out and connect with one another. The more you talk with others, the more you'll discover creative ways that can help you personally and creative ways that you can connect with others. How can we gather as a church? And if you have some creative ideas as how we can do that as a church, let us know. We'd love to try some of them out and just try out a lot of ways and we'll find a way to be able to gather together, to be, get, be able to gather together well. Number four, be listening. God is always speaking, but we're not always listening. What might God be saying to you during this time? What are you learning about your heart? What are you learning about God? What is he saying to you about reaching out to others? So find a group of people that you can use as a sounding board. Often we need the perspective of other believers to discern the difference between God's voice and our own imagination or ideas. But as you gather together, ask that question, what is God saying to us during this time? Another speaker I was listening to this week, Patrick Lencioni, you may recognize him by his great books on leadership. He had a good phrase. He said, God's blessing sometimes comes to us in packages that we don't recognize. We can stress or panic at the restrictions that are preventing us from meeting in our building, but we can also ask, what is God up to? He is up to something good. For several years now, the leadership in our church has struggled to find a good response to the question, as a church, how do we connect more deeply when people attend church less frequently? Culture is scattered as people are pulled away in so many directions, by work, by play, and by family. Could it be that our present reality opens up pathways of gathering and connection that will bear fruit long after these restrictions are lifted? God is up to something good. And that includes a journey of waiting, as uncomfortable as that may be, but don't wait in isolation. Find a way to gather together with other believers to explore these new pathways in our journey. We want to take some time to participate in communion. I love the description of communion by Eugene Peterson on his commentary in the book of Revelation. He says this, The many-dimensioned reality of salvation is preserved not by a truth that we must figure out or by an ethical behavior that we must carry out, but in a meal to eat. Not everyone can, can comprehend a doctrine, not everyone can obey a precept, but everyone can eat a piece of bread and drink a cup of wine and understand a simple statement, my body, my blood. I maintain community with the killed and raised Jesus who is salvation, not by learning something or performing something, but by eating a meal. So we want to do that today. I look back on that passage in Hebrews that we read, and that Hebrews passage reminds us that Jesus wants to cleanse our conscience he wants to renew our mind. We live with the shadow of our sins and the voice of the accuser who wants, tries to link every negative circumstance we experience to our own fault and our own failure. The enemy would convince us that God's uh, primary intent is to punish us, that God is against us. God wants to cleanse us from a guilty conscience so that we can have fellowship with him, and with the Father, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, he sent to live within us. He wants to renew our minds. That text also tells, tells us about the faithfulness of Jesus. He promises that he would always be with us. And that includes during a time of pandemic, pandemic. And he's with us as we participate together in communion. Even when we can't be in the same place at the same time, we can participate together and we can experience the presence of Jesus. A ballet dancer was once asked to explain the meaning of the ballet she had performed. And she responded by saying, If I could explain it in words, I wouldn't have to perform the dance. Communion reminds us of the suffering and death of Jesus, but it also helps us experience the presence of Jesus in a different way. The presence of Jesus, the one who is acquainted with grief, who bore our sorrows, who was raised to life, and invites us to be seated with him in a resurrection life. It's not about the elements we consume or the scripture we read or a prayer we pray or a devotional message we listen to. As we do all of those things, we experience the presence of Jesus and we do that together. Even in this unusual time when we can't do that in a gathered assembly in the same place, 
We celebrate his presence as a group, even when we're together in our own homes. So let me pray for us as we participate in these elements. We'll read some familiar scripture and participate in these elements together. I hope you've grabbed your elements already and we'll join together. Father God, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that he came and lived with us, that he died for us, he suffered for us. Thank you that he was raised and that he invites us to a resurrected life. So this morning, as we participate in these elements, may we know his presence. And even when we can't be together in the same building at the same time, may we know that the Lord Jesus is present among his church. And may as a church we experience gathering in a new way. Father, help us to continue to press on in that journey of following Jesus. We don't know where the paths will take us, and we recognize there's lots of new paths ahead of us. But thank you for Jesus and what he has done for us and that he is with us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So take the elements. Hopefully you have some with you. Bread and the cup. Scripture says this. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you to participate together. Scripture goes on to say, In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's participate together. Thank you so much for joining this morning, for being part of this. Thank you for being part of our church, whether you're here regularly or whether you're joining from somewhere else in the country or the world. Thank you. And may we know the presence of the Lord Jesus. May we continue to follow and find others in creative ways that we can just gather together and encourage one another, motivate one another, and together be followers of Jesus. Because we are the church. We are the assembly. We are the gathering. So let's continue to do that. God bless. We'll see you again next week.